And welcome. I'm so glad you joined us for the CSIS Smart Women, Smart Power Speaker Series and what is sure to be a great conversation with U.S. Chief Technology Officer Megan Smith. Um, in just a few minutes, she'll talk with us about how we can harness the power of technology and innovation. Um, first, I just want to make a quick reminder. Follow us on Twitter if you aren't already. Um, we're at Smart Women. And be sure to check out our Smart Women, Smart Power podcast series, which Apple actually named one of the best of 2015, and we are continuing to go strong in 2016. Uh, and it's also been partnered and grouped together as a iTunes University course, so you can actually uh, hear a lot of incredible women, including the uh, chief scientist at NASA and a number of others uh, who've spoken on our podcast series recently, so definitely check that out. Uh, and if you happen to be live tweeting, and we encourage that, you know, it's a tech-savvy group here today. Uh, so feel free to do that at um, hashtag CSIS Live. Um, also, for a quick uh, safety, because we are a national security think tank, uh, in the extremely rare case of an emergency, please follow my instructions. If something happens in front of the building, we'll go out the back doors and head over to the National Geographic. If it happens behind the building, we'll go out the front door to the beach Beacon, and I'll treat folks to drinks. So um, our Smart Women, Smart Power series wouldn't be possible without the support of City. Thank you very much for helping us to amplify the voices of women in foreign policy, national security, and international business. <clears throat> And I'd actually like to welcome Kristen Solheim, the Director of Federal Government Affairs at City, to just say a few remarks. Thank you, and thank you all again for being here for another exciting Smart Women, Smart Power series. We've had some great events this year, but this is one of the one that I've been the most excited about. I've heard Megan speak a few times since she's been in Washington, and I always leave more excited about the promise of technology and also, also what, what humankind can do with it. And I know she's going to have a lot to tell us about the exciting things that she's been doing since she was lured away from Silicon Valley in 2014. So um, thank you very much for being here, taking time out of your very busy schedule to talk to us. I know it's going to be an exciting conversation, and there's no one better to moderate it than Nina Easton. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks again for being here, and City's really thrilled to be a part of this exciting series. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. We appreciate City's support. This is the second year that City's been partnering with us on this effort. Um, so a quick introduction. Uh, President Obama named Megan Smith to the position of U.S. Chief Technology Officer in 2014. She previ previously served as Vice President at Google, led the company's acquisition on platforms such as Google Earth, Google Maps, and Picasa. Did I get that right? Photos, yeah. Something like that. Uh, she also co-created tech initiatives such as Women Technology, uh, tech, uh, tech Makers, Google's Tech Diversity Initiative, and Solve for X, Google's Innovation Community Project. Um, Megan received her bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT. Um, and here's an interesting fact. She was actually part of the MIT student team that designed, built, and raced a solar solar car 2,000 miles across the Australian outback. Now there's a story cool. there. I'd like fun. to hear that. <laughs> um, as always, our moderator is CSIS Senior Associate Nina Easton, and we are delighted to have her with us today as well. She's also the chair of Fortune Most Powerful Women International uh, and the co-chair of the Fortune Global Forum. Thank all of you for joining us today, and Nina, over to you. Great. Thank Thanks. you, Michelle. And thank you all for being with us. Um, the first thing you need to know about this interview is it's not going to be about technology. It's going to be about impact and how technology makes impact. And I think you think about you think about Silicon Valley, you think about ride sharing and apps and cool apps and things like that. And truly, I mean, Silicon Valley has transformed the way we live. Yeah. 
But this is going to be about impact in the way we like to think about it at CSIS, um, impact on people's lives. You're going to hear about technology helping fight hunger. You're going to hear about technology um, affecting incarceration rates. You're going to hear about drones fighting climate change. Um, so it's, it's like this is going to be a very different kind of interview than you might get with another Googler. Um, so, but first, we, as we always do with these, these sessions, we're going to start with Megan's background. Megan um, grew up in Buffalo and graduated from MIT. She got her interest in technology, building things with her dad. Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, so um, my dad uh, did, my parents both were just incredible entrepreneurs, and they always did things locally in our city. They did, my mom started the the Western New York Bike Club and all the bike routes that we had. My dad started the Recycling Center for Buffalo. Uh, first Ooh. Earth Day, my mom had a, a, a car, a biker, a walker, and uh, a bus rider have a race from the edge of Buffalo down. And I mean, they were sort of in the community. Yeah. Uh, and so um, one of the things that was terrific is uh, as, as the schools integrated more, um, magnet schools happened. And so I was able to go to this fabulous uh, magnet school. I had no money, but incredibly entrepreneurial teachers, and they required science fair. Huh. And so a lot of times that's an option. And so one of the key things, and for me, this is true, you have to do this stuff. It's like practice makes permanent. So if the kids all do active STEM science things, then they'll come to like it. So that was the same for me. Um, I uh, had this great uh, first our seventh, eighth grade teacher, and then our biology teacher just made everyone do this. Uh, I began working on miscellaneous things, but then Carter was putting solar panels on the White House, and the energy crisis was mm -hmm. here. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll do a project on that. And so for me, it was the other key thing, not only do it, but understand what it's for. Mm -hmm. And so I started to work impact. on yeah, impact, uh, alternative energy, green energy. So first, um, solar heating and housing. So my dad would always help me kind of put these, we built a house at first, a like a dollhouse, think of a dollhouse. And so I remember going down, of course, there was no internet. So I went down to the downtown library because they had this many books instead of like the three in yeah. our local branch library. And uh, looking through and starting to understand the principles of how passive solar and active solar work, but then realizing and starting to do some basic innovation or invention stuff myself about how I would translate these ideas to this house I was designing. And so my dad would help me you know, learn all the power tools and do those things, and we'd build stuff together. So you and I were talking with a, a group before, um, before the session this morning, earlier this morning, and um, about about not being afraid of technology and technology needing to be part of our lives the way reading is. Talk about that. Yeah, so um, here's an interesting like, piece of that. So, so one of our challenges just as a society globally is that we've gotten ourselves into a stereotype that there's technical people and not technical people. You can probably even feel that in yourself right now. You like think that's true. Um, I'm not a technology. Yeah, see? And so that's that feeling that you have, yeah. and it's coming from when we were in really elementary school. Today is active STEM day, by the way. And so it's, it's could we teach math and science the way that we teach art and music and PE? We have that scale. So we, and reading, we, and as reading. you point out. And so the way that we learn reading is it's, it's a kind of apprentice, journeyman, master kind of path. You start with some letters. It's circle time when you're three. You know, and, and you come along, and then you're like learning cursive. And eventually, you get to a point where you're writing paragraphs. You learn you know, middle school, that hard work of writing that first essay. And eventually, um, you know, you're, you're really writing to communicate in extraordinary ways through high school and into college. That's a path everyone goes on. Everyone expects to do that. You don't expect to graduate and not you know, people don't say, oh, reading, that was really hard. You just do it. Uh, and so this, this sort of stereotype about science and math, that, and, and it really lives in not getting to do those science fair projects. You're learning these facts that other people discovered. And so one of the things that we're really excited about is can we let the kids have uh, exploratory, hands-on, project-based learning when they're learning science and also math. Um, a friend of mine started math festivals. And it's always not a contest. It's usually with some mentors a little further ahead. You're puzzling and figuring it out. And it's in teams, and it's fun. Mm -hmm. So how do we take this stuff that we've made intimidating or super boring and flip it? 
and make you know, it part of our lives. The yeah, same way as you would how we're teaching need to it. know how to write an essay. Right, when you and, and that everyone's expected to learn it. And, and uh, here's a key insight that I got once was uh, I met um, uh, Suzuki, who from the Suzuki Method violin, mm -hmm. and he was 92. He was still teaching. He was amazing. Uh, I lived in Japan, uh, working for Apple right out of school, and so um, he. It turns out that he did the violin only because his father had a violin factory. But his actual theory was that any of us can learn anything to a deep, intricate level, as proven by our mastery of our native tongue, and that. The parents, when someone's learning to speak, and the, fa the community around the child are not requiring them to learn a particular way. They're just adapting as the mm -hmm. kid is learning language. And you learn to such a mastery. Hmm. What if we taught and adapted to the child? And so one day, uh, he was teaching fourth grade math. And he decided to, tr he said, I'm going to have every child get 100% on every test to check my theory. And he did it. Wow. So how can we adapt? Um, and we're, you're going to see a picture of Katherine Johnson soon. Um, we brought a couple images, actually. I'm going yeah, to click we're one get just in. to show you one yeah. of my favorite ones. But how do we get these little kids you you know, know, to so. feel that excited? And here they are in the White House at the science fair. They're talking to the president here, by the way, and they're saying, uh, he's telling us, tell me more. They made a page-turning robot. And he's like, how did you do this? They said, we had a brainstorming. Oh. <laughs> And then I said, OK. And then, and then we made a prototype. Oh. They're in first grade. And he said, they said, Mr. President, did you ever have a brainstorming and a prototype? He said, yeah, it didn't go so well. <laughs> <laughs> it was super cute. But like, how do we have this kind of experience? You know, they're feeling like superheroes. Right. Right? So that's what I mean. This is what I mean, that it's so, it's so joyful. And especially, and then the, the problem becomes especially for girls. And, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to get into that in a minute. And you, but you went against the tide. You had a, a, a grandpa who didn't understand why you were going into engineering. But next thing you know, you were building smartphones before, before anybody had ever heard. What was that all about? Back in the 90s. Yeah, so my Back grandfather, my like grandfather was so an away. engineer. When I was going to engineering school, he's like, Asking, talking to my mom, he's like, why does she want to do that? And uh, he couldn't see his granddaughter doing it. And when, when I went, he was super proud. But yeah, later, um, we worked on the beginning of these smartphones. And as a mechanical engineer, I was working on sort of touch screens and LCDs and cameras, all the things that you physically see. How old see. were you when you were doing I was this? right out of school. So I'd gone from MIT, went to the media lab, and ended up in sort of pre-internet things, which is how I shifted from more classic mechanical engineering into more internet. And then I uh, went to Tokyo and worked for Apple when there were about 200 people <laughs> before the internet. And then yeah. some friends were spinning out of Apple um, to found this company called General Magic. It was too early. A lot of times the companies, you'll see the beginning, like, like Android. Uh, Andy Rubin was there. Andy Droid Android. So Andy was there. And uh, it took him from that company to, he was at Apple, then he was at that company, then he made Danger. Mm -hmm. And then he made Android and mm -hmm. Google and Dubai. And we worked together. And Tony Fidel was actually there. Tony ended up making the iPod with Steve. So between the iPod and, and so sometimes things come like Intel. Intel has a company. There was a company called Fairchild before Intel. So sometimes you get going, and it's not exactly time. Like we were talking about things like apps and email and, and connectivity. But no one had the internet yet, or no one had email at all. So why would they want to take this thing with them? Right? right. So it was before we really were ready. And that happens a lot in technology. You see it finally happens in some form that's sort of like what you thought, but maybe probably a little Different. simpler. But yeah, so I got to work with the extraordinary. It was actually much of Steve Jobs' Mac team that had spun out of Apple. <laughs> that we're working on the beginning of smartphones, and we got to work with and them. And then you went on to run a company that was, was founded called, called Planet Out. Mm -hmm. What was that? So my friend Tom Riley created Planet Out. In the early days of the web, there were all kinds of communities. And uh, so the LGBTQ community, of course, was there. And so you saw these community uh, content and kind of community online forum. Uh, uh, and this emergence of like women.com and Black Bear Creek for Kids and Latino Link and uh, Net Noir or um, sort of the BET team doing their work. So you saw all these different verticals. And uh, Steve Case um, could see the gay community was very large on AOL and so was one of the early investors to create the content there. So my friend Tom had founded this company. I went to go run it with him. Uh, and it was amazing. So we really, uh, being part of the beginning of the web was so fun. Like people thought we were crazy. Like what's with the CB radios thing you're doing? Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, but it was you know, Jeff Bezos was starting, and of course Steve Case was here in DC with the AOL team. It was really exciting. You could see, and that's something I love to do. I love to work on 
things that help empower people with whatever it is they are doing, right. which is really these technologies um, and really networking talent is what the internet is about. The internet is just us connected. And then the other thing I like to work on, projects that reduce our impact on the planet, which really dates into my sort of science fair days yeah. of working on green energy. And you, you went, went to, to Google. Google. What did you end up doing at Google? Yeah, so um, I, I got there, we were about a thousand, just over a thousand people. And so we had a small team, team run, run by a guy named David Drummond. Uh, and so we worked on everything that related to the partnership work for the, for the product teams. So we called it new business development. So whether at the time the engineers had, Larry and Susan Wojcicki, who runs YouTube, were working on a project, we didn't want you to be able to only search on web pages. We wanted you to also be able to have any content. Now today we see books and videos and all different kind of content that anyone created. You can search and find all of that things that are available for, for sale, shopping, all these different kinds of content and data sets. But at the time, it was just web pages for search. And so Google had begun working on, really rooted in uh, Larry's work um, at Stanford around digital libraries. Could we scan all the books in the world? Could they be available, and not those under copyright, uh, all of it, but pieces of it, so you could discover so this books is like in addition to web pages. Music to somebody like me who writes books and articles and wants to be able to search all that. Right. So the first project was let's call these publishers. They had started talking to the libraries, and we had to cold call publishers and go visit them, say we want to scan all the books with you, and right. sort of convince them to do this with us. So it was always every project that I worked on um, with our team, this early stage business, was with the product team having some, some cool, cool idea and us together figuring out who are these partners, whether it was uh, licensing some technology, some metadata for the search of that, or whether it was calling publishers and seeing if they would be open to this idea. You know, who's gonna pay who? How's yeah. this gonna work? Is this a partnership? How much of the book would you show that the publisher would feel confident that this is more about discovery and not about giving away their content if it's still under copyright for the stuff that's before? So really interesting interesting work. And so we worked on every product um, uh, all around the world. We opened the offices in Africa together with colleagues. We, it was an amazing right, that adventure. That is so cool. And it was so fun. So we're going to kind of go into our, our slideshow here, which we're kind of, um, we're going to talk about the struggle of women in STEM and mm -hmm. their kind of disappearance from technology world. But then we're going to move into the better story, about, more optimistic stories about this. So, um, so our, our, let's go to your um, to this Let's next have one. you talk about the how women really were part of early STEM. Yeah, I think we're down by thirty-three yeah, percent so of we computer went, science graduates. It's not like women weren't part of the beginnings of this. Very much so. And and so in the eighties, we sort of went off a cliff. We women were kind of forty-ish percent of the graduates in computer science, and now it's down in the teens. What do you attribute that to? Uh, marketing of who we thought the personal computers were for. And so they just, we got this idea where they were for our boys and our husbands and that's. Just on marketing, just, that's amazing. Yeah, marketing and, and just culture and, and a lot of different things came together. And then we didn't culture shift out of it. So there was already, of course, all of the challenges of um, gender discrimination that are existing in every field. Right. Um, and so that plus this extra layer of marketing just sort of exited this community. So you're there. gonna show us. So I wanted to show you these pictures. So first off, for these kids, to stay in, they need to see heroes that look like them. That's one of the four things. They need to try it, which they're doing. They need to be encouraged, which they're doing. They need to know what it's for, and they're starting to understand, hey, there might be somebody, in this case, a page-turning robot, because they're saying if somebody couldn't do that, they would want to read. Mm -hmm. And then last one is that there were people like them always. And so this is um, part of the like kind of lost history stories. I don't know why this is like I'm sort of stuck. So I was on stage with Joanna Hoffman here. Um, this is the team. These are the original Rolling Stone photographs from the launch of the Mac. And so you guys have probably seen, some people may have seen the films, the like Jobs films, other films. So of the people in this pyramid, there's seven men, four women, and a baby. Uh, and you can see every man, many men, all the men in these pictures, have speaking roles during the Mac sections of the telling of Steve's life. And all of the women are not in the cast. Now, there's one exception in the most recent movie, and that's Joanna. Joanna was paid, played by Kate Winslet, and she won the Golden Globe for playing Joanna. Joanna's a, a physics grad from MIT who came from Eastern Europe, totally intense, and was wow. always sparring with Steve. Yeah. She's the product manager of the Mac. Right. Uh, marketing product, you know, like, what's this going to be and yeah. why? And sort of driving that team. Um, there she is here, uh, Andy Hertzfeld and Joanna, 
And Steve Jobs kind of opened that movie. They're looking up at the screen. Down here is uh, Susan Kerr. She's also up on the top there with the gray sweatshirt. Susan is an artist. She had a, they used to call her Dr. Kerr because she was the only one of, they were all like young 20-somethings. Uh, and so she has a PhD in, in art history. Andy was friends with her from school and said, we need someone to do the graphic design of what this thing's going to look like. Because the Mac is all about what you see, right? This friendly yeah. hello, the cursor, the sort of icons, the Chicago font, all of that is Susan. Wow. And we don't generally know that. Right. And so her work's in the Whitney. And the other thing, I was on stage again, I was saying like, Makers with, with Joanna, and she was telling me about the names that are in the physical back of the Mac. There's tons of women. Debbie Coleman was the manufacturing, and she was, so Joanna was saying, you know, for all of you guys who have, uh, have studied English, Debbie was an English major, she figured out how to manufacture the Macintosh, and she ran manufacturing. Okay. So this, this true history of gender balance that was always there gets edited out, and it's, it has two parts of it, not only the absence of them, and Joanna said that the Xerox Park team, which we know had done the first GUIs, the first graphical interfaces, and they came over. They're looking at the Mac. Steve invited them over. They're looking at them. They say, how much memory is in here? How did you do this? So it's just profound innovation that was done by, by Susan and Bill on the back end doing quick draw, which is causing it to be able to draw. And so we need to know not only that they were there, we also noticed in the movie, I was watching this movie, and I was like, I wish I had mystery science theater, you know, and these little things. We could talk yeah. about what they're saying because these people don't speak like those characters. So it's sort of like microaggression stereotype. So for example, um, so Joanna came out of the movie with her son, and she said, he said to her, he's, uh, Jeremy, he said, Mom, did you really iron Steve Jobs' shirt? Wow. And she said, you know, Jeremy, I've never ironed a shirt in my life, except once for you when we were late. <laughs> or, you know, there's a moment where they're, uh, they're talking and, and the character who's playing Steve is mad at Andy because his demo's not working. And, this, you know, it's all about the amazing at launches, which Steve was so incredible at. And so he's like, Andy, I'm not going to talk about you or whatever. And so-and-so did this. I'm going to talk about what they did. And so-and-so did this. And so-and-so did that. And Susan did the bag. And Susan did the bag? Did Susan really design the bag? Hmm. Or did she design everything we see that now still influences all of our lives when we look you know, at our phone and we see these icons? Lost history. Lost history. So next slide, you see also this is part of women, um, women in, in media in general, um, meet, or entertainment media in general. Yes. So briefly go through that. I came across this on the web. It's on polygraph.cool slash films. And it's really amazing. I'll maybe start down here. This is uh, a look at children's television. So right now, when our kids are watching TV, the majority of they watch, these are boy lines to girl lines. So blue is boy lines. So it's just overwhelmingly, we're, 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 cause, we're writing for the world we grew up in, where we're just letting the male characters speak more than the female characters in whatever film or media it is. You know, Frozen is a really good example here. It's 54% boys lines. Even though the it's girl a girl's film. movie. Yeah, or Milan, 74%. Yeah. And then up here is our adults. We grow up and we do the same thing, men's lines to women lines in 2000s phase. And this speaks to data because the, we, we don't mean to do this. We inherited this. None of us ca are causing this, but in Hollywood doesn't mean it. But we need to have tools and data science tools to help ourselves as we're in the writer's room or other places to reveal what we're doing in this sort of propaganda gender bias. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, this is Katherine Johnson. Explain so that. Catherine, uh, Catherine is the uh, African-American woman born two years before the vote who calculated the trajectories for uh, Alan Shepard, first American up, John Glenn, first American around, and the Apollo mission. There's never been in a movie I've watched an African-American mathematical elite leader calculating the trajectories in any of the Apollo Hollywood films. People didn't know that history. They lost that history. We're really excited because Hidden Figures uh, is a new film that's coming out uh, for the holidays, winter holidays, and we're going to see that story. How do people see story. Hidden Figures? Uh, it'll be in the theaters. In theaters, yeah. Yeah, it'll be in the theaters. Um, the actresses were actually uh, in Toronto. The film team was in Toronto with some of the early cuts, and they were crying. Yeah. This is Terry G. Henson, who plays Cookie on Empire, crying, saying, I can't believe this is true. I might have been a scientist. Yeah. And so this is Catherine herself with Willie Mays. The uh, president's giving them the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, it's the highest honor you can receive in our country. Mm -hmm. And so we've been doing, um, 
women in technology. Did I get into there? Yeah, we've been doing work on lifting these stories. And you see it, the president often speaks of it. He was speaking of it at Frontiers. But using each other to lift the stories. I was just with 12,000 women, a computer scientist at the Hopper, Grace Hopper celebration, sorry, 15,000, on the same day that the Navy was naming the new cyber building, breaking ground on the Naval Academy cyber building, naming it for Grace Hopper. Raise your hand if you know who Grace Hopper is. Yes, that's pretty good. He, she's an Edison-level American that we all should know because she invented coding languages. Amazing, amazing realm on the Navy. So, so untold history. It's really important to keep in mind. Um, so now we're going to move on a little bit to what we were talking about earlier, how technology has an impact. Um, you had this sustainable um, development goals contest. Yeah. So, and you're yeah. going to tell us you're gonna, the coolest projects. Yeah, so this is sort of this, this idea. So people, do people know the Sustainable Development Goals? These are after the Millennium Development Goals, uh, turn of the century. This is the next 15 years. So the UN has done extraordinary work across leadership and civil society and everybody creating a framework for really driving on you know, climate action and life on land, life on water, sort of peace and justice, gender equality, infrastructure, economic inclusion, sort of all the topics. That It's a really comprehensive, incredible structure. So, we saw that they were going to ratify, this was one year ago, 2015, UN General Assembly September meetings. And so we asked some colleagues at the UN, the UN Foundation with Kathy Calvin, and uh, some of the UN Non-Government Liaison Service and others, would you guys like to do something slightly different to accelerate? Mm -hmm. Could we uh, post a form from the UN that says, OK, world, we're about to ratify this. Who already has solutions in progress? What do you got? Do you have something you've already done that's amazing? Not an RFP, not what idea do you have, but what are you already doing? And so we posted that, uh, the UN team posted that, and we got over 800 submissions, this was August before September, from 100 plus countries in two weeks. And it was an open web call, and so this is part of this like acting in new ways. How do we get the sectors interacting more and using these new methods? So let's use an open web form. What do you got, world? And so using the ministries of, of science and tech and the fellows programs, just blasting this email around the world. It's like crowdsourcing yeah. innovation what to you, solve what social problems. Exactly. And, and in this case, it's scout and scale. It means, it, that means not like, let's brainstorm how to fix blank, but what are people already doing? Because people do things. And if you can find them and come up underneath them, if, if government's less of a parent and more of a platform. So that's where, this is a great term you use, venture catalyzing, yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. So you want to venture catalyze these people. So let's go find and them. That's, the, that's what the government's role should be. It could be. You can, you can think of the government as a stage and with some safety nets around it. And what might the people do? Yeah. How do we facilitate that? How do we venture invest in them uh, in the way that you can? And so what this is showing you is what we found. So a volunteer group combed through this crazy list of amazing innovations, came up with a really nice collection of about a dozen people from all over the world, men and women, who were already solving these problems. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite ones is in this corner as a techie. This team is using drones to plant a billion trees a year. Isn't that incredible? Rapid reforestation. Incredible. Brilliant idea. So they're in the middle of prototyping that. So they're, you know, so instead of thinking of reforestation, we can hear from them and others like them and say, how do we accelerate you? Right? So here's a group up in the corner um, that's, uh, let's see, on the right, just above them. So in Uganda, in many countries, uh, people don't have um, representation when they go to court. A lot of people end up in prison who are not guilty. But they don't have the, the, the um, public defender systems at the same level. They just don't have the resource. So these, this team in Uganda was like, why don't we just teach the law in prison? Hmm. And so they have brought curriculum. And then you study the law. You study it generally, your own specific. A woman got herself off of death row from her cell and changed the law so it's no longer capital punishment. So you can get thousands of people out of jail by having them get themselves out of jail. So thinking about talent as everywhere, including What about tomatoes? Oh, the tomatoes are my favorite. <laughs> so these guys, there's this incredible uh, guy. He has two million listeners on the radio in Nigeria. And so he said um, what he noticed that when you come to market with your food, if you're in a hot place, it'll really um, rot. rot. Within, let's say that you have all these tomatoes, it'll rot in maybe 48, 72 hours. And so all your money gone unless you sell quickly. So he's like, why don't we use the same idea as Airbnb? 
we'll have cold storage at the market and we'll share it. So for a quarter or two, you put your tomatoes in, you have some at your stall, sell, and then like you could have 21 days, right? You, and then you could 10x your money. So it's a, it's, it's a fabulous project. And, and the, project this one is really great. Okay. This, is, um, this is a young man from, from Ghana who is uh, going to University of Michigan. They, he's a computer science student. The, he and his friend are, are studying, studying the blockchain. blockchain. Uh, and so, you know, Bitcoin blockchain, how you do transactions using mm -hmm. this digital. His house in Ghana, on it, it says, this house is not for sale, as do many houses. Imagine if you had to write on your house, this house is not for sale, so that those people wouldn't show up and sell your house to other people because the records aren't available, because that's actually happening. And so he's like, well, I'll just do blockchain, and we'll start to figure out how to have land records in this modern methodology. And we can have them available and on our phone, and we'll go from there. And you can prove and see that the house is not for sale. And so people don't get taken, and also you know, the terrible things that happen. Just brilliant. So why don't we listen to this? And then this last one is one of my favorites. This is. Um, the floating fab lab is yeah. Really, okay, I love Have that. you ever been uh, in a maker space? Does anybody know about the maker movement? Yeah, I know a couple of people. So maker is imagine if you could go in your high school to the home ec room, the shop, the art room, and maybe a little bit of the lab, and it was a place with all those tools like my dad would have helped me have. Yeah. And you just go in and they're like, what do you want to make? Yeah. Right? And so that's what that space is. And it turns out it's a movement. The president hosted the first ever Maker Fair at the White House. And now we have a nation of makers. There's these spaces. This is one in Baltimore in a rec center. Someone took the rec center. In the industrial age, we needed to go play basketball and have recreation. We want to continue that. And how about a maker space? So now they got nano for little kids, mega for big kids, 3D printers, hammers, whatever you want to do, art, and you just make and things. And staffed by? Staffed by all kinds of different people. So some of it's volunteers, some of it's paid. The libraries are starting to do this. The schools are starting to do this. We're working on the ag centers. So George Washington Carver and Wallace, yeah. uh, Secretary Wallace created the ag extension. Secretary Vilsack has them over his desk. You know, and Carver went to, after he figured out how to nitrogen fix the soil using peanuts, it's kind of the, let's, let's save ourselves from malnutrition guy, not necessarily the peanut guy. Uh, wow. So he went and he trained 2,000 farmers using the Jessup wagon, like a meetup, like a tech meetup. So how do we take that kind of same energy and use these incredible centers? We have a university, uh, Ag Extension University, Cornell, Davis, uh, Michigan State, and every state who's networked to a physical space in every county. That's our ag extension that was used for innovation in agriculture. Let's, the 4-H kids just did UAV flying contest on, in, earlier in October. How, there's 7 million 4-H kids. How do you get these networks that we have invented that are awesome to just upgrade, to add you know, rec to tech, ag plus tech? And you start doing that. And so in South America, these are all these different uh, countries who all have networks. networks. Mm -hmm. And the Fab Lab, that's the Fab Lab network. It's really like an invisible part of the world all right. networked with each other, having their Burning Man TEDx life, right? right? And then everybody else, also awesome, is over here, but not using those methods. And how do we get that how to be get them a methodology? And so this is one that is so cool. This is a Fab Lab space, that same home ec shop thing, floating in the Amazon. So the kids are loading, running off the dock loading. into this imagination place. And so what would the extreme wow. talent that lives in the Amazon, these people who are so bioinformed, have indigenous culture and knowledge of things that we really desperately need to bring back into our society of how systems work at the most fundamental level. And how would they, this is a prototype idea that they have and they're starting to build this, what would they do and invent if they had those kinds of modern 3D printing and other kinds of tools right there? And it actually, this design splits apart and goes up river. So they're busy working on that idea, but what an incredible idea. So to bring this back also to a personal level, um, you were a co-founder of the Malala Fund, which is a, a per, let's, let's just take that as an example of how technology is lifting an effort to lift people. Right. So. Um, you know, Malala, Malala when, when, uh, she, when the attack happened afterwards, it became clear she was going to be okay. Right. So then, I, you know, again, it's who plus what. Who does the thing? Who does what thing? Mm -hmm. You know, people do things. So Malala and her family seem pretty awesome at figuring out how to solve education challenges uh, and, and have that inspiration. So as the entrepreneur of that, 
how do we come up underneath her and have her lead us so that the Malala Fund should be Malala leading us? Because you don't us. know much about how to, you know, do, do education in Pakistan, for example. I don't, like you but like she's there, yeah, so, so she I'm yeah. like, how do I help you? Yeah. So how do we come up underneath our greatest entrepreneurs? And how do we make all of us entrepreneurs and team up with each, each other on the thing that you're most passionate about? Because this is about creative confidence. And whatever that creative confidence is, and whatever your passion is, we could solve all these SDGs if right. everybody had creative confidence and collaboration skills, and really didn't feel intimidated by all these things, and really could use the network we've invented. Because the internet, again, it's just us connected. So what would it feel like if it felt like that at school? Yeah. You know, and you come in and you're learning, it's so joyful. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's fun to think it's the, it's the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. And Star Trek is both the tech things that they're showing us, but it's really Roddenberry's vision of everybody's on the bridge, and we're off exploring and learning and you know, working on peace and discovery and, and collaboration. So I want to pause here and remind everybody that you can submit questions by, does everybody have cards, Bev? Um, Bev will get them, her staff will get them to you if you need them, but um, we'll be ready to take questions in a, in a short while. Um, we are now going to some of the um, issues. Okay, so what's our next one? This one. So I just clicked it. So this is, this is the She's idea. She's way ahead of me. OK. This is the idea of platforms. OK, so everybody, most people in this room probably have a phone. You have some apps on it. Um, you might be able to go to a web page and do different things. You can think about Facebook and the apps on there. So one of the areas that you have today is if you wanted to go and know what the weather was, you would open some kind of news app and you'd have this incredibly sophisticated data science piece with the sun and the, the weather right here and that. That's sitting on top of NOAA. You know, yeah. the Department of Commerce data sets there. And in fact, there's a wonderful history of a, a Navy person in the mid-1800s just deciding that every sailor will now, will now on every ship, every 15 minutes, we're going to keep the weather, the wind, and we're going to track this. That data set mm -hmm. that the Navy had allowed them to shorten the trip from New York City to San Francisco from one year to three months. Wow. Right? So data is so powerful. So we have opened 200,000 data sets. The president has done that. He, he, it's one of his first things was through the Anishwa CTO executive order to ask all the agencies to do what Noah's doing or do what, um, you know, if you, want, if you got here, you might have used some kind of mapping application, right? So this sits on top of US Geological Survey, the names of the streets and the locations of things. And Google Maps does too. I mean, is Google Maps like? Google Maps, Bing would, Maps, Google, Esri, Google everybody. Google Maps relies on US data is what of you're Of course, saying. yeah, or global, uh, our global data, data. Every country yeah. has some ground truth base of data. Google Maps, Esri, Bing Maps, all the maps that we use are sitting on top. So what if you thought of every agency, what might you be able to build on top of the Department of Labor, the Housing, housing and Urban Development mm -hmm. Census? And so this is the census team. When you go in census today, it's so cool. Like census is the biggest data thing, right? <laughs> census is big data, a couple hundred years, right. right? So when you walk in, up on the, in the lobby is the Constitution, we will count the people and we will share the resources, mm -hmm. right? And then you go in and there's a cafeteria and right near it is an innovation space, just like 1776 or some of these tech spaces. So you walk in there, 400 projects have gone through there from a one day thing to whatever. So it's like a space where we act together in this yeah. new way. And there's teams in there. So one of the teams started to think, why don't we take the data sets that would be helpful for smart cities package them in an easier way for the app developers and other developers, Internet of Things, those people to use them. And they created a software developer kit like you would have if you wanted to make apps for your phone. Four cities, a city SDK, a city software developer kit. Because you can go to facebook.com <coughs> as a user, or you can go to developer.facebook.com. If you go to developer.facebook.com, it'll teach you how to make apps on Facebook. If you go to developer.amazon.com, I'm not sure that's the right URL, someone here is from Amazon, or Amazon Web Services, you can make stuff on top of Amazon in addition to the consumer front door. Right. So shouldn't the government do that too? Yeah. So this is opportunity.census.gov. <coughs> if you go there, sorry, you will find uh, resources so you can see what data sets you might build on. And uh, earlier this, this month, month, there were 26 new apps that launched from this is Redfin. So Redfin is telling you, what's the opportunity score in this place for jobs I can have that I can walk to or take a bus to, transit to, within 30 minutes? 
What are the price of housing here? What about Head Start? Hmm. So you can design for 100% of the people, not just people who can afford to take ride sharing or, or have a car. I was going to say, how do you like, but how do you reach like, you know, people of limited means through apps and online? And it just seems, is that Me realistic? Yes. Very much so. So there's there's a couple different parts of that. One is that uh, a lot, most, many many people have smartphones, and for those who don't, we have other work that we're doing to just increase that. Whether it's Connect Ed for connectivity in schools, Connect Home, and housing projects and other places to increase the connectivity there, because you want everybody to be able to online. Because can you imagine just like saying, hey, this week you're not going to use the internet. That'd be really hard, right? right? And so let's have all Americans empowered because everybody's got talent. Right, so busy bringing that. So these are examples of where, whether it's the Great Schools team, a nonprofit that has launched an app that's pulling the data from the Department of Education around all kinds of quality scores and making it so you can really see it. Another of my favorite ones, I don't know if it's in here. I think, yeah, did I put College Scorecard in there? I don't think so. But College Scorecard was a team from 18F and the United States Digital Service who worked together to not launch a website uh, on behalf of our students. So students right now with student loans, it'd be really helpful as you choose your school to know lots of things about it, including how much does it cost, what kind of graduation rates happen here, and what kind of money do people make out of this major. We have all that data. If we make it available mm -hmm. in, in uh, application program interface, just available to app makers. Then you help the market then people start can, putting pressure on higher education. Right, and you, you can know, have that yeah. content not only show up in a reference app that, that the US Digital Service at the Department of Education made and launched, but it's actually now available to surface in search or some of the most popular places where young people are. Right. So that when they're clicking around, they just come across this data and it becomes a feature set. And so it's sort of releasing what we have, setting the stage, and then people will take that data take resource and, and move it into other so places. So I wanted to bring in our audience a bit. I know we have more slides, but um, what's the role of technology in the fields of health and medicine, and what is the most exciting thing happening in these fields? Yeah, so um, the president was just at the Frontiers Conference mm -hmm. and talking about uh, um, personalized medicine. Um, and uh, the Brain Initiative and the Cancer Moonshot, really this opportunity to use data um, to do better research, the way the genomics you know, sort of personalize the, the cures for people. So extraordinary things happening there. The other thing that's interesting you wouldn't necessarily think about is uh, patients having much more voice. So if you have an illness or your child or your, your parent or somebody has a, an illness, you can be in a network with other people who have that and start to work together as sort of patients um, and really debug and solve problems together together with the medical community. Right. And then also, so, yeah, yeah, ahead, artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's why, so here, here's, so given the challenges brought about, I'm glad you brought up AI, um, given the challenges brought about by new technologies like AI in the coming years, what's your plan to take advantage of self-learning with new tech tools and facilitate the process to learn new skills and stem cells, not only for stem digital skills stem cells, stem skills, sorry, not only for digital natures, but also digital, oh, digital oh, natives, natives, sorry, but for digital immigrants. I like that term, digital immigrant. That's what, <laughs> I, that's what I aspire to be. Okay. Um, that are most affordable. <coughs> Anyways, you get the point. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, we just released the president's artificial intelligence report that was through a series of town hall meetings at universities all across the country, open, open meetings and conversations, uh, looking at how do we use uh, data um, and AI, and how do we also as a government begin to look at control and safety and the downward pressure. So Council of Economic Advisors working with us in, in New York City around the job pressure. So we're about to go through a major transition. You know, none of us are out uh, plowing the field. We've gone through transitions, right? We go through industrial age. We're about to get into the place where really data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are really going to change what we're doing. And so uh, it's estimated that for those who are making $20 or less, 82% of their jobs are going to see downward pressure on wages because we're automating, similar with all the job levels. So how are we getting ready for that and building the skills of everyone to be able to be in that world? And how are we also using these things? Like this is a slide about the police data initiative, data-driven justice. We were able, this is a 10th grader teaching the police chief in New Orleans how to code. And now, now they're, they're working. working on justice and releasing trans transparency and communications and solving problems there. And we have all of these jurisdictions now um, working in a bi-weekly conference call on the data sets to try to improve justice 
in their cities. Miami-Dade closed a, closed a jail, closed a prison, by innovating in data and to having people out of jail, from 7,000 people to 4,900 right? by thinking incredible. through how to do mental health and substance abuse disorder in a better way. Let's create a community of practice to share that idea and anything else we can find so we can rapidly solve problems and get ourselves out of these challenges. I think Megan, by the way, is the most popular speaker we've had in terms of questions <laughs> so far. This is, look at this stack. It's just, it's just, um, it's piling up here. Thank you for your remarks. I'm interested in learning your thoughts about the ongoing prevalence of harassment and violence against women online, which mm -hmm. a lot of us have been subject to. Um, how can we, with policy development and ICT professionals, address this issue and make online spaces truly safe and accessible to women? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because it also ties into the Vice President's work on the It's On Us campaign, Campus Sexual Assault. One out of every six young women are being assaulted. One out of every 20 young men are being assaulted. This is crazy, and it's a culture challenge. And so we inherit this culture, and we have to shift it. And so it's, it's interesting because we were going to, you know, this is about data on diversity and inclusion in the workforce, but the data is out there about um, how to see, you know, one of the greatest data scientists this country's ever known is a woman named Ida B. Wells. And she, in the 1800s, late 1800s, as an incredible journalist, together with data, really tracked the data on lynching. And she held the mirror up to our country. And it helped people, not only her, her incredible journalistic skills of telling the story, but also the data, really sort of like, like a class action law, so you could see hmm. that this was unfair. And Americans understand unfair, if you can make the case. Mm -hmm. And we shift it. And so the same kinds of things need to happen with data to help us. You know, this one that I was going to show you has to do with the pay gap. Secretary Pritzker of Commerce packaged up APIs around our wages, made that available in a, in a, in a way it's not private, it's the general longitudinal data. It's an API set called Midas. And the Presidential Innovation Fellows, which are like White House Fellows, Peace Corps, they come in, entrepreneurs and residents, created Hack the Pay Gap. And they started to really work on what kind of tools would help us? Can you figure out your own individual pay gap and show it to yourself? How do you start to understand this huge challenge that seems daunting using data and innovation and open innovation? This is pay gap. We can do that same kind of things with the data sets of online. And that doesn't mean that's the only one. Just like in criminal justice reform, Valerie Jarrett and Neil Eggestein, who lead that in the White House, Cecilia Munoz, they are doing all the things they know how to do, but we can also add in this swim lane of tech and data and innovation and apps and seeing things and really go in an IDA's path. So um, the question of cybersecurity comes up, and um, it came up earlier today. I, I want to point out that um, this is not Megan's main, she doesn't, this isn't her purview. That's actually the um, Department of Homeland Security. Right. Nevertheless, um, as this question says, many of the projects you mentioned point towards an internet of things future, but have you seen many innovations that also take cybersecurity concerns into account. Yeah, so are, you pop, are you optimistic on that front? Yeah, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, again, that I, I don't work on cybersecurity. We do tech innovation writ large, so you might work with those teams on new methods and other things. You know, the president has really, uh, there's the Cybersecurity National Action Plan that has come together. People are, are really working on working that. There's the, the commission. And so there's an extraordinary amount of focus here, because this is, as everybody can, as experiencing, this is one of the challenges of our time. It's it's a commercial challenge. It's a government challenge. It's a, you know all sectors, and so you know how do we how do we put ourselves in that position? I think you know, and we're doing that, right? We have these teams. There's Are sprints that go on. Have you changed your behavior online because of? <laughs>
sector, from education, from innovators. Mainly, like I was just in Chicago, they've got, I think they taught a thousand teachers, so helping the teachers learn this so they can bring it into the classroom, whether it's a full class or whether it's just integrated into English class. You know, I was saying downstairs about whether, you know, next time you're on Wikipedia, just on something that you like, just click edit and look at how it appears, sort of uh, markup language of the page, and then hit cancel, and you can sort of go back and forth and see the coding behind that page. So why don't we do that in English class? Yeah, that's not intimidating, yeah. right? So making these on-ramps in every class, with co what's the computation component of this class, uh, is a big thing. And it's really, as you said, it's going to take a movement to do that because it's very distributed. So this question is from the National Security Director from Raytheon. Innovation requires creative confidence to generate prototypes to solve the world's problems. But the US is one of, uh, one of very, oh, I'm sorry, is one of very few countries that encourages the free flow of ideas, and even we often limit these successes or accredit them to men. How can we inspire creative confidence in countries where the combination of political and cultural restriction yields as many national security threats as solutions? Boy, that's a good question. Tough one to answer. Yeah, so um, I think there's many different parts of this. Uh, we, have, we launched something, the State Department launched Global Connect, um, which is, so this, there's a couple different pieces. One was I, gonna, I was gonna yeah, show you this, which I think is a helpful idea here. This is called National Day of Civic Hacking. It happens in June, it happened in all these places. Hacking is not like breaking in, hacking is sort of sprint solution making. So people who don't usually work together, they might be tech, they might not be, they might be high schoolers, whoever shows up. Uh, there was just one on mental health. Um, so it was incredible. We had uh, uh, great um, doctors, somebody who knew the Twitter feed, some students, and they were looking at the Twitter feed and they could see, they were trying to see whether in the Twitter feed you could predict uh, suicide. And they could tease apart two different parts of that, people talking about suicide on Twitter. There was a set that was clearly a set of words that were people talking about it versus somebody possibly attempting. That's amazing wow. that you could see that. And so in a sprint of a day, by getting the right cross-functional group of people together, that insight came. Now that team has day jobs, so they're not going to do that. But at the end of that sprint, uh, the HHS team, other teams can go do something, take that to the next level, or somebody, an entrepreneur there. So in the same way, I think I can go to any city in the world, any place in the world, and I can find these people. I know how to find them. They're everywhere. I was in Herat, Afghanistan. 80 miles from the Iran border, and there, were the, there they were, doing their hackathon stuff. They had six little new companies. Um, they were just grad, this group was just a group of kids or young people who were just graduating from the university. They had six new companies, and they decided to do a volunteering project of doing uh, crowd-based mapping for all of Herat and then Kabul and stuff to get that base layer of the map so that they, their, their Esri and wow. Google Maps would work. And so whether it's the, the teams, right now we have 21 guests um, as part of an international visitors program that the State Department started this week of the digital govies like us mm -hmm. who are appearing in over a dozen, there's you know, about a dozen countries. Estonia is the furthest ahead, are doing this. Because they have these people, and they're like President Obama, they're bringing their people into government, and it's starting to transform. It's really just like the beginning of smartphones. It's the beginning of digital, open, data-driven government. So in answer to this question, I mean, you're basically saying there's, this, there's these, these grassroots efforts that basically bypass government and, and security controls because it's, the energy is coming. They're just innovating from, together. And so maybe they get shut down or not, but then people publish that those countries are shutting down the internet. Um, and uh, people invent things like speak to tweet. So I remember during the, uh, you know, during the um, challenges in, in uh, Egypt, as the internet went down, speak to tweet was happening so people could like call and then other people would post on Twitter. So people are very ingenious. And so this is a, a thing that we're working on, which is the faster we can get the internet to everybody, then that talent is unlocked. And so Global Connect is really about getting like the, the prioritization, getting uh, the financial folks to include it, not as a luxury, as a basic. So if we're, running, if we're digging, let's dig once and run fiber. If we're running water pipes, let's run fiber with it. If we're stringing cables for power, let's run fiber. And, and then let's also get some of the same tech crew that the president's bringing for digital service delivery 
the people who've built the back end of Verizon and Amazon and know where all those undersea cables are. You know, they, if they saw a map like that, they'd be like, oh yeah, and you forgot the other cable. You know, they just know this stuff. Let's ask them to do a tour of duty in these, in come up with basic things like a Surgeon General would so that the vendors were more informed and can move faster. And we've done that. So Secretary Kerry was with President Kim. And so we launched Global Connect and we have the IEEE, which is the largest engineering organization in the, in the world, now hosting conversations in India and in Tunisia. And there's a cable going from New Zealand, or sorry, from uh, Oregon to New Zealand. They're passing all these islands. It costs maybe five to $20 million to land in Fiji. So someone called Fiji you guys want to have the Mississippi River of speed rather than get off the satellite? And they're like, yes. So find that money, get it done. So it's a systems integration problem of getting everyone online. And then the very hard challenge is that this, the, the, the question of culture around open and not, and that's going to be a really interesting conversation. But the faster we can let the people do their thing, that's sort of where we're hopeful. So Megan, as we run out of time here, I want to ask you one final thing. Um, you have obviously really been steeped in how technology can make an impact on the well-being of human life. Yeah. You're sitting here in a room full of people who care about that, who are either um, you know, early in their careers or, or they're not, or older at think tanks and thinking about these things. What's your piece of advice to all of us, a, a wide range of people in this room, but, but with the same goal? What's your piece of advice looking forward? Yeah, I think um you know, and this is from the President's Frontiers Conference, all these frontiers that we have where there's just extraordinary opportunity. You know, not just smart cities, but smart, inclusive communities. Uh, an example would be Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So Raj Chetty, who's on stage here, is talking uh, with Sandra Moore from Urban Strategies, and he's talking about his work when he was at Harvard and I was at Stanford. He got into the IRS database, and he did some longitudinal studies on poverty. And he looked at whether, one of the things he looked at is whether it did it, does it matter where you live? If you're making a, a, a salary that's very low, does it matter where you live? And it turns out it does. And they stack rank the cities, and it turns out if you're in Baltimore, it's the worst place to live. You're gonna make several thousand dollars less. So if, let's say that you're that family, that, those parents, that mom or dad, do you move? Well, I hope you don't move because in the same city within five miles is literally the team that took us to Pluto at Johns Hopkins. So there's sort of like this potluck problem, like take your neighbor's kid to work day. Hmm. Like we have everything we need. We're the richest thing in the world, the US government. And how do we as people start to think about system integration? And what we have now with these tools is it's easier. It was really hard to do that before. But now if you have the internet, you actually could have an internship for this set of kids over here and you have to maybe figure out transportation and some food as well as an awesome you know, internship. Right. But how are we mixing up all the assets they have locally or federally or globally um, and really doing it in a way where like, I don't need to go help you as a parent, as a kid. I just need to include you because you're awesome and make sure you have what you need. Uh, and so as people have that, we can really solve the most extraordinary things together. And the, the thing that you know, we talked about earlier, it feels daunting, um, some of this tech stuff, because it's unfamiliar. But you don't have to learn it. You just need a teammate. And so thinking, I remember um, I was on the Vital Voices board, and I was talking to Elise. And she's saying, we want to do more of this. And I was saying, well, how many people you guys have? I don't know, 50 or something. I go, well, next time someone leaves, just hire one of these people. And then they'll be in your organization. And they'll speak this language, so they'll start crowdsourcing all kinds of resources around you. So sort of not only what the president has done, which is he sort of could see coming out of the campaign that this whole group of data science techies, there was no seat for them. He had an economist and a lawyer and a surgeon general and a science advisor, and a, but there wasn't a seat for this person. They had to go work under. But he needed their mind not only for their implementation, but for their architecture. So he added CTO, and then together, uh, he's helped us add all these other people, United States Digital Service, ATF, Presidential Innovation Bills, so that there's a teammate. Right. right. And so I think that's the key message for you guys is that there are extraordinary new ways that we've all invented to do things. And there are also extraordinary ways that you know how to do things. Both are good. And if you mix them up, we can do incredible things. We can solve the SDGs together. And so the way to mix them up is not try to do it. Our colleagues might say, oh my god, we need something like LinkedIn. We'll say, great, let's use LinkedIn. 
Yeah. Right? So you don't have to copy. You just need the teammate who does it and use the, use the stuff that's here. Well, Megan, you've put a whole new definition on systems integration. <laughs> um, and you've also given us such a, an uplifting, optimistic um, view and vision of a world that is, has a lot of trauma in it. So yeah. thank you so much for that vision of the future. Thank you, Nina. And thank you 